My issue with the mission on Foster's estate is thus. There's no tension. I was in shock. No way it would send me back that far. But alas, the plan really loses faith in itself by the second half, where all the creative and fun puzzle elements slowly fade away and This video has been brought to you in part by 3-6 Mafia Banking Solutions. Let's plan a robbery. Together. It never ceases to surprise me when I see how long the PS2's life cycle was. Even after the 7th generation of games started, the PS2 still chugged along, due in no small part to games on the Wii usually getting a PS2 port. Did you know there was a PS2 port of Silent Hill Shattered Memories? <laughs> I certainly didn't. Then you have the PSP ports, which were a mixed bag. A mixed bag of assorted puke. Then there are the multi-plat sports games, which kept the system afloat until the dawn of the 8th generation. I blame Brazil. They love soccer, and the most popular system in Brazil was the PS2, even until recently, so it makes sense that companies would capitalize on that market, even as late as 2013. But what fascinates me are the games that were made exclusively or primarily for the PS2 after the PS3 and Xbox 360 were already out. Smaller developers and publishers who couldn't quite make it with the more expensive hardware relied on the PS2 to keep themselves afloat. And one such game is TH3 Plan, a game that was released in 2007 for PS2 and Windows PC, but I've literally never seen the Windows version. In fact, I wouldn't have even known about the Windows version had someone not used the Windows box art for one of the OST tracks on YouTube. Back in 2012, there was a single EB Games in my area that still sold PS2 games, and I would pop over there every now and again for some cheap entertainment, usually after a hard day of sucking at skateboarding. God, now I'm getting all nostalgic. One day, TH3 Plan was the one game that really stuck out to me when I was passing through. It's an unsuspecting game to be sure, but it's one that utterly surprised me, because for a budget game coming out for an ostensibly dead system in 2007, it's not bad. Considering it originally cost $15 at launch and I got it for a dollar, it certainly gave me my money's worth. And yes, I know it's supposed to be the plan, I'm being facetious. Alright, starting the game up. What's with this music? I'll take uh, unintentionally dirty music for 600. Yeah, it's kind of weird that this is how the game greets you. Music that sounds like softcore porno music. I mean, the rest of the soundtrack is pretty good, if a little bit subdued. Which makes sense tonally because this is a game about silent espionage, but this is just jarring. Okay, moving on. Oh joy, would you look at this. TH3 Plan was made in 2007 and yet not only lacks an option for progressive scan, which is bad enough, but also lacks the option for widescreen. You know, I didn't care about this when I first played this game, but in hindsight, this is an egregious oversight, especially by 2007. Okay, so the story centers around this band of thieves mid-heist. There's an exhibit in this museum with two authentic Rembrandt paintings, so your crew is hired by the Mafia to snatch them. Everything's going well until the shifty-looking member of your crew who looks like Albert Wesker's brain-damaged cousin goes into business for himself and takes off halfway through, leaving half the crew stranded and the person who you might think at this point is the main character, Alan Segel, to get caught red-handed and carted off to the clink. Five years pass and your former associates come to you with a plan to break you out and take down Albert Wesker's look-alike, whom I genuinely can't remember the name of. Ah, uh, okay. Uh-oh. Looks like you have a plan. I have the plan. Womp womp. In fact, if I'm being honest, I can't remember a single one of these characters' names other than Valerie, and that's because she's the one with the nice polygonal ass. I had to make a chart of characters to keep track of who was who because they're so interchangeable. So as it turns out, Stephen Foster couldn't move the painting without getting the second one as well, meaning to make the plant deal to exchange the paintings for a high-value diamond, he needs to steal the second one, and we're not letting that happen. Imagine that, if Stephen Foster had just a little bit of patience, none of this would have had to happen. So the goal is, over several multi-part heists, rob Stephen Foster of everything 
everything he has and take revenge for his betrayal. First, we need to pull off a train heist to steal the diamond that this entire deal centers around, then steal the second Rembrandt, then break into Foster's estate and destroy the whole operation. As stories go, I've certainly seen heist plots that are much worse, but I have to admit that this whole thing does seem rather generic. It could be elevated if this game had good presentation, but the presentation is lacking in a great number of ways, centering around the fact that this is an ultra-low-budget game made by a nothing company or companies. I'm having a hard time really finding info on this game, but it appears to have been produced by Monte Cristo Multimedia, which went under in 2010, and developed by Eco Software, which surprisingly is still around today. Furthermore, in one of those bizarre before they were famous moments, Quantic Dream was also involved in this game. Yeah, Quantic Dream. Heavy Rain, Detroit Become Human, Baron Von Teapot's fucking ludicrous adventure. Hey, did you know that Quantic is Latin for a very poorly written? Point is, this game is ultra low budget and it shows. This is one of the rare games that doesn't actually have an IMDB page, so I had to wait until the end credits to even find out who voices these characters. Then I did a manual search for a couple of them and couldn't find any of them, or I couldn't verify if the credited actors were the same ones as the ones on IMDB. Like, Garrick Hagen almost has the same name as Garrick Hagon? but they're clearly not the same person. So this game has an even more obscure voice cast than Devil's Third, and it shows because you can't get a speck of conviction out of these people. All fingers and toes accounted for. My ears are ringing, but I'm intact. I'm in one piece, but my bones are still rattling. Go easy on that stuff. A little bit more and we'd be on the moon. You know me, I go for the dramatic effect. Christ, they're more wooden than Notre Dame. Oh, right. I don't blame them, they were probably inexperienced and never did any major roles after this. I think the one character who has a decent performance is Nathan Admiusin as Robert Taylor, who's nonchalant and has a subtle edge of suave in his performance that's really appealing. If you were in time of need, I'm sure she'd help you again. In fact, let's just say that she's redeeming herself as we speak. I also think that Jay Benedict as Stephen Foster is fun when he's hamming it up. There's a retirement package in it for you too. Oh really? Haven't you always wanted an island of your very own? Not so much when he's putting so little emotion into his performance that he might as well be voiced by the Microsoft text-to-speech program. So be it. Prepare to die. So be it. Prepare to die. Furthermore, the presentation of the story is very inconsistent. Sometimes you get voice acting with no text, sometimes you get text with no voice acting, and sometimes you get both, and it's utterly arbitrary as to what you get in any given scene. Much of the story is conveyed through these motion comic style cutscenes, and... yeah, they suck. Apparently they were hand-drawn. I say apparently because it's not very apparent. They try to have a minimal level of animation, and when the animation is implied or in the background, it works somewhat, but any time they try and add animation beyond the minimal, it looks jarring as hell. It looks like they plastered a PNG image onto a Vegas timeline and motion tracked it there. Yeah, it looks very cheap and thrown together. In fact, so cheap and thrown together it reminds me of the opening cutscene from Duke Nukem Forever, and that's not exactly a comparison you want to have made. Granted, once you get into the game it actually looks alright given the fact that it's a PS2 game. It even has to render the game three times on screen, which might explain why it doesn't have a widescreen option. Increasing the screen size might have been a bridge too far for the modest PS2 processor, especially considering the frame rate is already sub-20 in the big environments. That's gonna get one solid yike from me. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, if you plan on playing this game, hunt down the Windows version, you'll probably get better performance and can likely force widescreen. Regardless, the models and environments are pretty high quality, but the animation does look a bit weird, like they're all running around with a full diaper. What did Quantic Dream help out with again? Oh yeah, their texture has improved, but that's besides the point. Anyways, much like the rest of the deeper presentation, the story as a whole also feels a bit all over the place. First of all, I mentioned earlier that Alan Segel is who one might think is our main character because he's the one who was locked up for five years and therefore you'd think that he'd have the biggest beef with Stephen Foster, or just Foster for short, and there's nothing to stop you from thinking that at first, but then over time you notice that Robert Taylor, or Taylor as he's called, the guy who visits Alan in jail after five years, is pretty well in every mission, is the one to give the debriefings, and is the one who meets with Foster in the later parts of the game. So it turns out that he's the main protagonist, even though there's nothing about him that makes him overtly more of a protagonist than the others, because he has the same level of importance as anyone else. In fact, he has less importance because Valerie is Foster's former girlfriend, and Alan was the fall guy. Taylor's just another one on the team, so when Taylor ends up being the one to face Foster in the end, it's like, he's the least important of the main trio. Why is he facing Foster? He's given the role of main protagonist solely for the fact that he's the handsomest guy in the plot. Glory hogging bitch. 
Plus, the game has a habit of skipping ahead and not telling you or filling in the gaps by virtue of the fact that not having to explain makes it easy. For example, Valerie is established in the opening cutscene as Foster's girlfriend who's just tagging along, but then in the next scene after the five year time skip, she's working against Foster to break Alan out of jail. Okay. And where did she get the fake FBI identity when she's helping get Alan out of jail? Doesn't matter, apparently. Then the whole thing about Taylor meeting up with Foster at Foster's estate just kinda happened. No explanations given as to why they'd meet up with each other, they just did off-screen. Furthermore, when did Foster set up a crime syndicate and get his own estate in the Californian countryside? He just did in the preceding five years without explanation, which I guess explains why they did the five-year time skip, because otherwise they'd have no way to explain his crime empire, which furthermore doesn't explain why they left Alan in jail to rot for five years. Oh wait, they did give some form of explanation. In that case, I wish you were still hiding in the shadows. Where you been? Oh, you know, playing low. A few solo gigs here and there. Looking for our friend Mr. Rembrandt. Yeah, some explanation is right. They also fail to mention where Foster got all the money to set up the estate and the crime family when he couldn't move the Rembrandt painting, which was the sole reason for the betrayal. Did he win the lottery or something? Then, where did Interpol come from in the train mission? How'd they know Alan was here? And what happened to them after Alan, Valerie, and Taylor got away? Did they just not see the train leaving? Then, why'd they stop coming after Alan after this mission? They don't show up after this at all. Lots of unanswered questions here. Now, don't get any false ideas. The Interpol in this game is much closer to that of the real-life Interpol, a support mechanism for the police forces of the world meant to catch international criminals. You ain't gonna see any anthropomorphs or jetpacks around here. Though it's funny how I've seen Interpol used in only two gaming properties, and they also both contain multi-part heists, a suave main character, a frail nerdy character, and a large-scale betrayal. Hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. I'm touching my chin so you know I'm thinking. Well, anyway, I think the game does come alive briefly around two-thirds of the way through when you narrowly retrieve the second Rembrandt painting only for Foster to ambush you and reveal he was counting on you getting the second Rembrandt painting all along and steals it from you. A predictable but necessary twist. So now Foster has both paintings and is looking to trade them for the Mafia's diamond, so you have to infiltrate his compound and take the paintings back before it's too late. Unfortunately, this is all backwards. My issue with the mission on Foster's estate is thus. There's no tension. The entire crux of this massive deal is to trade the Rembrandt paintings to the Mafia for a giant diamond so Foster can retire to a private island. A diamond that we already swapped out with a fake several missions before. So for all intents and purposes, we've already ensured that Foster won't get any sort of financial gain from this operation once it's all said and done. This is all just being done out of spite at this point, but I guess the point of this game was to spite the asshole who betrayed us, so what the bloody hoo-ha. Foster finds this out, but it's already too late. By that point, the Mafia is already in an all-out battle with Foster's guards because the Mafia is convinced that Foster stole the diamond, but then Foster says this. Walk away from whatever you've got planned tonight and I'll make you and your team rich beyond your imagination. Oh, okay. So if we decided to walk away, he'd split the difference with us and make our whole team rich. Okay. Question. Why didn't you think of that five years ago? Or five days ago when you decided to hold us all at gunpoint for the second Rembrandt? If he was willing to work with us the whole time, why didn't he? None of this would have had to happen, but no, now he decides to torture Taylor, leading to a rescue mission. Yeah, like I said, the story's all over the place. It's not bad, it just kept undermining itself and skipping ahead without telling you. If it had more focus and properly paced itself as to not undermine the stakes, like say Foster somehow got his hands on the real diamond, it would have had more tension. Like how about Foster knew Taylor was gonna swap out the diamond with a fake, so Foster preemptively swapped the real diamond for a fake and was planning on betraying the Mafia all along. Hey Foster. My boy has already got the real diamond. You mean this diamond? I knew you were gonna try to pull something, so I swapped the real diamond for a fake before you ever had the chance. Hey boys, you with the mafia bosses? Commence Operation Fluffy Bunny. Followed by gunshots. I don't know, I'm just spitballing. Furthermore, if Foster maybe tried to make Taylor sell out the rest of his crew for the benefit of Taylor and Taylor alone, that would have instantly fixed this little plot hole, so the compelling parts of the story are equally weighed down by the inept bits, making for a mixed bag plot, and if I were to describe the entire game with one phrase, it would be mixed bag, which is reflected in the general review scores that the plan received when it first came out. It has a perfect 50% on Metacritic. As a matter of fact, I went to check out the review touted on the back of the box. Yeah, you know how developers will put quote 
quotes from positive reviews on the back of the box to say, Hey, look at how good we are! Here's proof! Well, I went to check the review in question, and not only is it a negative review, a 4.5 out of 10 specifically, but it literally doesn't have the quote that's on the back of the box. I read over the entire review, and that quote was completely made up. I hope somebody got fired for that, because that's something I've never seen before. A quote from a review on the back of the box that's utterly fabricated. Wow. Maybe it's because worthplaying.com is obscure enough that they thought that nobody would check. Well, I checked because I'm just gangsta like that. If they really thought nobody would check, that's hilarious because Worth Playing is one of the few surviving reviews of the game left. Most of the other reviews on the Metacritic page are long dead. <laughs> Sucks to be you, whatever remains of the team that made TH3 plan. I'd hate to be the person who bet on that pony. Can I also just say, I hate the title. Like, I know it's supposed to be pronounced The Plan, but they decided to arbitrarily stylize it even though the only three in this game is the three people you're controlling. They probably just decided to add the three to zhuzh up what would otherwise be the most generic name a heist game could have. It's the same thing that Fury 3 did. Maybe I'd learn to appreciate it more if I played TH Plan and TH2 Plan. Waka waka. So, with cards firmly on the table, as I said, TH3 Plan is a heist-based game. It's hard to sum it up as far as a succinct genre, but it's a stealth action puzzle game with elements of a third-person shooter. Wah, now that's a spicy meatball. The big USP, as you can see, tee hee hee, is that you control and can swap between three separate characters on the fly as you solve multi-layered puzzles. This is the part that really makes the game work. Each character is assigned specific stats, strengths, and weaknesses, so you're required to swap between them to handle certain puzzles most efficiently. For example, the obligatory woman on the team can't run or crouch walk, but if you need a long distraction, she has the speaking ability, which means she can distract guards for longer than anyone. I have a feeling this will say a lot about the developer's views on women. Basically, all of this is an aid of casing the joint for a heist or enacting a heist. You may need to distract guards to hack a security camera without being caught or sneak into or out of an area with potential hazards everywhere, so you need to use your members who have their own specific skills and stats to do specific tasks. All of this while switching from character to character on the fly. I was describing this game to a friend recently, and he asked me if it was a turn-based strategy game, and I said, no, it's real time. It could have very easily been turn-based, but it ends up being so much more exciting for being in real time because it means there's no time to think or prepare. You need to be on your toes at all times, using the right characters for the right things all the time, and just doing basic tasks is exhilarating when you're having to manage three characters at once. Let me tell you about a few of my favorite moments in the entire game. There was one point where I needed to sabotage a film projector twice to get a guard to leave the side of the museum director so I could covertly pickpocket the master key from the museum director, scan it to make a copy, then put it back. However, I accidentally sent Taylor, the person with the key scanner, to sabotage the projector, so now he was trapped hiding in the room with a guard. So I had value my best talker, distract the guard so Taylor could sneak out of the room via the ladder behind the guard. And who knew that climbing a ladder could be so tense when you're not sure if your distraction will last long enough for you to get away scot-free as you're watching that timer tick down. It's obtuse, but it's obtuse in the best way possible because it makes you really think about how you want to approach these situations and you have to put the work in to perform in the optimal way. Anyway, then I got the key and we went on as planned. Then later in the same mission, you have to distract the gift shop clerk while another one of your crew picks the lock to the room with the main security terminal. Then you need to break into the safe to get a blank ID. From there, you hack the main security terminal to take control of the cameras. However, the cameras need to be hacked individually in a very narrow time limit and they have to be done in a very specific order. So you need to run around the museum like a headless chicken, distracting the guards and hacking terminals. It's fast paced stealth and it's freaking awesome. Let me give you a tip for the recon missions though, if there's anything that requires you to take a picture, do that first because those are the easiest things to do and they give you a lay of the land before you get into more serious business. Some of those objective lists may look intimidating, but if you take it one step at a time, you'll be out of there in time for lunch. Thankfully, you're given all the controls you need, like a command to make either the player on the left or the player on the right follow the main character, and if you hold either L1 or R1, it'll make the characters corresponding to that direction do the same thing as the main character. Of course, with fast-paced stealth, to compensate the guards are dense as asphalt. They have a very narrow range of sight, and even when they do see you, they'll rarely do anything unless you're being blatant in how you're breaking the law. Hell, you start out in a maximum security prison, and with the help of one person, you manage to break out. Even when the main gates are opening, nobody suspects a thing. Like, there's nothing suspicious about this? Really? I guess this is one of those universes that don't work unless every single person in it is a moron. Hey, an FBI agent is demanding to see a prisoner. Cool, we'll just let her. No need to verify her identity. Oh, there's a new janitor starting tonight. Well, I guess there's no need to check for any records of interviews or check with the managers to see if they heard anything about the new guy. Hell, we blow the museum safe to kingdom come at one point. 
heist worthy of Larry Lawton. Incidentally, the explosives expert in this game is named Boomer. Nope, too easy. After that, we take about 10 to 15 minutes to escape, and there are no cops at that point. If this were real life, there would be every cop in a 5 mile radius and a SWAT team on the scene in 5 minutes if that. I'll take this over a game with ultra realistic AI, but it's kind of amazing how dumb these people are. Now let me give you a tip, if you choose to play this game, don't die. Oh, thanks for the tip TGX, next you'll tell me not to mix my rum with bleach. No, hear me out. There may allegedly be a checkpoint every few steps, but sometimes they lie. In the second part of the museum heist, I had finished the mission for all but Bernie Stanton, aka Geek, who it turns out needed to go back to the entrance wing, but I couldn't control the other two because they were finished the mission, so Geek had to make it on his own. But the entrance wing was locked, so I tried hacking the panel, and then an unseen guard shot me to death. Okay, I thought, until it sent me back, halfway through the mission to the obnoxious drone bit again. I was in shock. No way it would send me back that far. But alas, I powered through and then one misjudged drop for expediency had me die again and sent back to shortly after the drone bit. Fuck! Finally, I managed to get through without the game imploding and moved on. That was a tough pill to swallow that turned an hour-long mission into an hour and a half. I think the game might be a bit glitchy, as evidenced by the train heist part in my first attempt playing the plan where the train decided not to load in. Where are the textures? Or how about that time where I got caught by a guard right when I finished my final objective, so Alan just froze there because a failure state and success state were both activated simultaneously. So I decided to get myself caught so I could get sent back to the checkpoint, but the failure state is in engine, so when the failure state cutscene is activated, the final objective of meet at the exit was technically achieved, so I activated a success state and a failure state at the same time for a second time. The whole distracting person X while person Y does something else is pretty much repeated for most of the first half of the game, but there are plenty of other things you need to do. Even in the more action-y missions, you have to do things like go through and hack security terminals to disable security cameras, which will usually result in all security gates being locked if they're tripped. Or how about disabling the lights during a meeting with Foster and the Mafia representative so you can steal a keycard? This requires you to use the night vision goggles, but what the game fails to tell you is that up and down on the D-pad switch out the items in the circle position. Yeah, they bother to tell you all this redundant bullshit in the tutorial, but fail to tell you crucial info on how to swap items, forcing you to stumble into it. I mean, you'd have to figure it out eventually, but this is probably the worst way of going about it. Even worse is in the Museum Heist Night 2, where you have to activate three terminals at once to get a security passcode. Issue here is, the game tells you to press L1 or R1 to get the corresponding character to do the same thing as the main character, but fail to tell you that pressing both will suddenly make all three characters do the same thing. I had to look that up. Maybe it should have been obvious, but the game sure as hell didn't tell me. Then there are the mini-games. The lock-picking mini-games are as generic as it gets. Just point the analog sticks in the right direction, and you're golden. The safe-cracking mini-game is just turning the dial in one direction, then the other, then back, then win. Taking pictures is semi-organic, which is pretty cool actually, adjusting the zoom and focus. Then the creme de la creme of baffling mini-games is the pickpocketing mini-game. You have a ghost hand you have to keep your real hand aligned with. Am I the only one reminded of Quidditch on the PS1 Harry Potter games? Anyone? It is what it is, it does the job just fine, but it's kind of unintentionally hilarious in ways that I can't quite explain and should probably talk to a psychiatrist about. Sometimes you can pickpocket important items and whatnot, but most characters will give you money. What is the money for, you might ask? You'd think arbitrary completion, but actually no. This game technically has a two or three player mode, but to unlock the multiplayer in any given level, you first need to collect all the money in that level, and I mean all of it. If you miss one dollar, you fail. So what this game is telling me is that I not only need to beat the level, but I need to prove that I've mastered the game before I can play it with multiple people. That's so backwards. That's too much work for something that should be available by default, and the way it is now ensures that if you do unlock multiplayer, there's always going to be one person who's way more experienced at the game than the other person or people. This is the type of game that basically doesn't have any replay value. Even though it is fun, once you've played it once, there's no way to play it differently, so if you have one person who's already played it, then the experienced person will inevitably be carrying the inexperienced person, and the inexperienced person won't be able to figure things out by themselves. So it's a lose-lose situation to the point that there's no way to shake it. It. The multiplayer is badly implemented to the point that it might as well not be there. Yeah, I was never going to play this game multiplayer, but what if someone did? What if somebody brought this game home excited because it said three players, only to find out that the multiplayer is locked? It doesn't say anything about the limitation on the back, it just says up to three players and there are no known fixes. What pricks? 
But at the end of the day, the plant has some fun ideas and is generally enjoyable to play. So if this game has all of these fun ideas and creative execution, then what's stopping this game from being one of my favorite PS2 games? Well, all that good shit I mentioned takes place within the first half of the game. The plan really loses faith in itself by the second half, where all the creative and fun puzzle elements slowly fade away and make way for generic third-person shooting action. You see, the warning signs were there as early as the second part of the train heist where you're given the stun gun, but at that point it felt very token, and like it was really only there to get you past a few obstacles that otherwise you wouldn't have any way to get past. The stun gun is also what amounts to an instant kill. But after that is the museum mission, and the first two nights of the museum mission are the absolute highlights of the game, so I thought nothing of it. Then from the second half of the museum heist onwards, the puzzles slowly fade away, the three-player gameplay slowly becomes more token, and mandatory gunfights become more and more common to the point that it takes over the gameplay, and these gunfights are on the level of something like Trigger Man. Y'all ever played Trigger Man? Well, don't. I understand that games need to raise the stakes at some point, otherwise they become stale, but the plan progressed in the complete wrong way from where it started out. It starts out really well, building up to an apex, and slowly but surely, everything I liked about it dribbled away. All the hoopla surrounding Foster's estate could have been more of a subtle espionage mission, but practically right off the bat you're expected to cap motherfuckers at every which angle. Foster's estate has its moments, like that one mission where, as Valerie, you have to excuse yourself from Lu Ling, who gives you two minutes to use the washroom, then unlock a way into the mansion for the two other characters, although I was having the most tremendous trouble opening the hatching question for some reason. It's very particular with where you need to stand. Anyway, beyond the odd aspects wherein you need to excuse yourself from Lu Ling, this entire heist is all action, all the time. And it's not exactly easy to handle gunfights when you can only shoot one person. There was one part I kept dying at because we were getting bombarded by guards, but I could only effectively use one person to shoot with, so they kept killing the other guy, all the while Nina Wilson, aka Headshot, is sniping some guards in the way of some of your allies. It should be mentioned at this point that there are so many interchangeable characters I stopped trying to keep track. Anytime you're in the underground areas, it devolves into a gunfight. There's one mission in the sewers where the worst puzzle you need to solve is draining a bit of the sewers because Headshot can't climb ledges. <laughs> Useless bitch. Otherwise, it's just opening gates and shooting people. Boring. But the absolute worst mission for this is the last mission before the final boss, where it's just a linear series of enemies and turrets you have to kill or disable. It's the most tedious mission in the game, and for the record, the poultry 3 recovery items per character that you got wasn't an issue up until now, but this is the mission where it simply wasn't enough. In the end, after many tries, I managed to brute force my way through by abusing an AI bug and went off to the final boss. Now explosives have been planted all throughout the basement of this mansion, and it could blow any minute, but you still have unfinished business with Foster. Just run away from the turrets and shoot them when they go down so they break the windows, then shoot the explosive barrels that are near Foster. Apparently if you disable all the turrets before finishing Foster, there's a second part to this boss fight. I don't know, I never let it get that far. It should also be mentioned that this was literally the first indication that Taylor was the main character story-wise. He went on to fight Foster. Okay. That being said, how does every great game end? With a massive fucking explosion. Damn right. And with that, everybody goes their separate ways. I suppose the Mafia will want to cut a deal for the paintings and diamond. We'll cash out, and all of you will live the life you've always wanted. Sound like a plan? Yeah, Taylor, I'm pretty sure the Mafia is not going to take too kindly to you stealing from them. Also, Alan's still a wanted man, lest we forget. Oh yeah, I guess Valerie and Taylor are a thing now. Damn it, my guy Alan got left high and dry. Then, everybody slowly disperses as the burning remnants of Foster's estate peters out. The end. That last shot is one of my favorites in the game. It's so quaint being able to dwell on the end of an adventure and watch as everybody walks away from the adventure of a lifetime. It's hard to describe, but I just like lingering on shots like this. And that was TH3 end of TH3 plan. Or as actually I'm just realizing the front cover looks like, TH3 the heist, the betrayal, the revenge plan. A very inefficient name, I might add. I'm not gonna lie, this game was a bit of a disappointment. Not because I expected much, but because I got my hopes up in the first half, only for the game to fall apart from the second half onwards. There's a massive niche right now for games about skillfully planning a heist, and the plan was that, but then it wasn't. I'd say this game is still worth it for the first half, and wouldn't even call the second half bad. Beyond the gunfights, it still has its moments. But I feel to really have brought the most out of the heist concept and the three simultaneous perspectives concept, they really needed to come up with a better... plan. Boosh! See you next time. This video was brought to you in part by my lovely patrons. I thank you for your continued support. If you want to become a patron for TGX, the link is in the description.
PH3, the heist, the betrayal, the revenge plan. A very inefficient name, I might add. I, I'm, I'm genuinely, I, I'm genuinely just realizing this as I'm looking at it. 